So say we want to do a background around this Cornwall black square here. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of clean off a little bit of excess staining that got on there. Okay. So one thing that's good to do is just outline the smaller shape first with a smaller brush so and get a nice clean angle on there. You don't have to worry about a bigger background brush potentially brushing glaze over the detail that you've already painted with a contrasting color. And since I've incised that line in there around my design, that means that my design is going to be a little more what you see is what you get. Sometimes I have beginners who are, I urge them to draw in their designs and they say, oh, I'm just going to paint them. But what can happen is when two contrasting colors are right next to each other and touching in the kiln, they will also run together when the glaze is in its liquid form and that can cause your shape to feather. So if you've got this nice graphic shape like here, uh, it can come out and it'll have like a teardrop that comes down. It'll have these watercolory feather edges. It'll be barely recognizable and it can be really disappointed, especially if you've got kind of a geometric sensibility and you like those kinds of designs and you want to do it in ceramic on your designs um, you can't just paint them on the way that you would with paint and hope that they just stay there so going ahead and applying my three coats around my design here This white has titanium in it, which can be a little chalky. So that's why I'm sort of patting on my glaze here. Because it's so dry that even when liquid, it can be a little patchy. So you also want to give yourself a visual confirmation that you're not seeing bald patches of bisque coming through your glaze too much. Just kind of pat that on there. The glaze underneath will grab that and dry it on there. Okay, and those brushes will pretty much fire out. Okay, so I'm going to take a bigger brush and do the rest of the design around there. And now I can be a little less exacting with the brush strokes because I don't have to worry about running this larger brush over my geometric design. So make sure that you just overlap a little bit with what you've already applied. So the strokes will flow into each other and create one cohesive shape when it's all fired together. So again, I'm staying above my pencil line there. Start again where you first started with your second coat, just coming to the edge of where you did the outlining. So don't paint over the area where you've already applied three coats of glaze because that is where you can over apply glaze and then you'll get that runny situation. You can run down the side of your piece. Okay, so I'm going to wait for that to dry before I apply my third coat. I can see that it is still kind of murky and dark. So we want to wait for that to dry. Okay, so while we're waiting for that to dry, we can turn around and look over here. Okay, so on this one, I'm creating a stripe of white in this visual element here that I will then surround with the black glaze. So if you do see little bald patches where the bisque came through, just take your brush 
just patch that area. You don't have to reglaze the entire section. Just get it into where you missed a spot. Okay, I'm going to come in here. Okay, if you do want to combine two glazes, one on top of each other, contrasting colors to see what they do, you want to make sure that you know in your mind how many coats you're applying. So say I wanted to apply some titanium white over the titanium green. I want to make sure that the total number of coats still adds up to three. So don't apply three coats of green and then three coats of white because then you'll have six total coats and that will cause your piece to be extremely runny. So the outcome will depend on how much of one or another you have on top of each other. So if you have two coats of white and a stripe of green on top, it'll probably be a mistier, lighter color green. If you have two coats of green underneath and then you try to put a stripe of white over the top, that green is so heavy and dark, it will probably absorb most of that white color and um, uh, can even absorb it to the point where that white stripe will be invisible. So, so you just have to do a little experimenting and realize that darker colors are a little more intense and they'll absorb more and bleed through your lighter colors a little more. Okay, so I'm going to come back here. I'm going to apply my third coat. It's nice and dry underneath there. So that should grab that top coat. You don't have to worry about it creating bald patches. So once again, I'm just glazing up to the point where we did the outlined glaze around our geometric shape, overlapping them slightly. Don't get too much glaze overlapping each other on the boundary line there. And once again, I'm just applying these super lightly. You see I'm not grinding the brush. If you grind too hard, you can create little bald spots. Which can also depend on the stiffness of the bristles that you're using. Brushes come in all kinds of grades with different kinds of bristles. So a really soft brush, long bristles, nylon, that'll be softer. It'll apply more glaze, but it will also be less harsh when it's applying the glaze. Okay. And that will make it less likely for the glaze to be stripped out by the sharp bristles. Okay. This brush is a little stiff so you can see if I press too hard it does take off the glaze a little bit. Okay. And that's just a characteristic of some of these glazes. Take this Cornwall black. Okay. An edging brush. Again, I'm just going to come up here. This black glaze is a little softer. It's got some clay in it, so that's why it is not as brittle as the white and the clear. Okay, I've 
commercial glazes that are for brushing often have a food grade gum in them that makes them sort of a pudding consistency. It keeps the brush strokes wetter a little longer so they're a little easier to flow. These glazes that we're using are the dipping glazes from our studio. So they're not always formulated for brushing large areas. So that's why I'm taking some pains. I know this is really tedious since you're literally watching paint dry, but since we're adapting a little bit for our situation online, I want to make sure that you guys know how to successfully use the glazes from our studio. Okay, so let that dry a little bit. Okay. So I haven't used the green yet. Let's see if we have successfully thinned that out so it can be brushed. Okay, so if it still seems thick, I can add a little more water. We'll try it like that for now. I'm going to put a little bit on the rim of this piece here, so don't forget to glaze the rim. Okay. That looks pretty good. Okay, so remember if you have any edges next to each other, they don't have an incised line separating them, those two glazes can feather together. So I've got a little clear underneath the green, which probably won't affect it too much, but you can get a little effect like watercolor when those two edges bleed together in the kiln because of the heat. show you in a second what I mean. Okay, so while that's drying, we'll take a look at one of our previous examples. This teacup, I've got this peacock blue on the outside. I've got this buff kind of rutile white on the inside. And I let the two really um, combined together on the rim here. I applied some of that rutile beige. I also brushed up some of the peacock on the top there. And you can see where the two colors combined created this third color, which has this really kind of pretty watercolor um, cloudy surface there. The green blended in with the uh, whiter color. You can see the green is the more dominant color, but it also changed the color from kind of a peacock to more of a, a yellowy copper, copper green. Um, and sometimes even when you mix two glazes together, it won't even be that obvious. Sometimes a chemical will react really strangely with another chemical. And instead of getting uh, a green or something within the spectrum of the colors that you used, you can even get like strange blush colors, brown colors, purple colors. It just really depends. Okay, so once again, experimenting is really helpful. And also, if you do something really unusual, you want to make sure you have a record of it. So always write down in a notebook what glaze you've applied where on which pieces. So create a drawing of your piece and sort of graph out what glazes you use where. So this titania green is kind of a nice matte green. And that'll look interesting on the surface of this piece, which you could use for keepsakes. Some of them, if you already put a hole in the bottom, you can use them to put plants in. With these matte glazes, you don't always want to use them all over the surface of something you'll be drinking out of, just because the matte can be a little unpleasant as a surface on a drinking cup say.
Okay, so I think for this leaf element, I'm going to do some white lines. And for the leaf, I will do the leaf green. So we're going to use our sponge technique. Get one of my clean, smaller brushes. a little thicker just because that white is really close to the color of my clay color. I want a little more to stay in there so there'll be more of a contrast when this is fired. If I were just to do a thin coat of white over a dark clay color, just like you combine a dark glaze with a dark clay, and the dark glaze will absorb the lighter glaze. The same thing can happen with clay. So if I were to have, say, a really dark glaze underneath, or really dark clay underneath here, like Black Mountain, and I brush some of the titanium white over the top of it, the pigment in the clay will combine with the glaze and darken the glaze. So if you do it a little thicker, make sure you get your nice three even coats on there. You can get a little more contrast. We'll let that dry. Okay, that'll look pretty. Let's go back. How are we doing here? Yeah, we're, we're getting there. It's looking pretty good. Okay, so remember when this fires out, these glazes are going to be more saturated looking. They're going to be uh, shiny. And in some cases, like this Cornwall Black, they are going to be a different color entirely from what you see here. So glazing, it just takes some practice to get a sense of the results that you're going to get. Okay. So for a curved shape, I'm going to use a round brush. So I'm not worrying about the straight lines of the rectangular brush. Working against my Working against the curve of my leaf there. Okay, so I'm using smaller brushes for smaller areas of my design. Okay. I know it seems really obvious when I do it, but sometimes when I'm teaching, I will come around the studio and look and see what people are doing, and someone will have a one inch wide brush that they are attempting to do a little design like this. And it is really difficult to keep the glaze where you want it when you're using a brush that's too big for the area that you want to cover. Get closer to the line, be a little further away from the line, and then squish your brush down. And it'll get in really close to your line there. For smaller areas, you want to make sure you don't have a lot of excess glaze on your brush. So you just point the brush, get on your nice first coating. You do have a lot of glaze on your brush, scrape off a little bit or move your brush over to an area that needs more glaze. Apply it there first before you come over to the smaller area. So 
So any place that you leave unglazed, it's just going to be the color of your raw clay, but a little darker because these are going to go high fire and the carbon in the kiln will pull out the chemicals, which are usually iron in your clay and create a more toasty surface. So this beige color, it's not going to be the permanent color of the piece. So don't have that in your mind. So you wanted to do a pink flower and you think, well, I'll just leave this like pink open area unglazed on my piece. Um, and when it fires, it'll come out looking like this because that's not what's going to happen. That pink area will then be brown, <laughs> which can look pretty, but might not be what you want. Okay. So I think that'll give you enough to get started on there. So make sure that every area you want glazed is glazed with an even coating of glaze, three even coats. And then the last thing you want to check is make sure you don't have any glaze on the bottom. So if you do get these little kind of leftovers and volunteers on the bottom of your pieces there, just take a clean sponge, sponge that off, make sure you don't have any glaze. Okay. If you have any glaze that dips down below the line that you drew for your boundary, make sure that you sponge that off so you get a nice even line there. Okay. And there you go. And hopefully when that comes out of the kiln, it will be very beautiful looking.